Hello, and welcome to the first part of a series where I'm going to explore how we can implement networking in a C++ environment. I have briefly touched on networking before with my hacking a Logitech keyboard to display Twitch chat video, and in that video we introduced the idea of sockets. However, the problem with sockets is they're very platform dependent, and they can be quite fiddly and tricky to work with. Instead, for this series, I'm going to use a technology called ASIO, which stands for Asynchronous Input Output. And specifically, I'm going to be looking at how we can develop a framework which will allow us to support a server client system. In the first part of this series, I'll be demonstrating some of the typical problems you encounter when you start adding networking to your applications. And I'll show how ASIO can reduce some of those problems. But on top of ASIO, we're going to need this custom framework, something very simple that we can add to future applications and allow us to have clients talking to servers or applications talking to applications very simply. Networking in C++ is traditionally seen as quite a tricky thing to do because there is no standard for it. But by adopting a library like ASIO, we can ensure that our programs will compile for different platforms. And it's my hope that the ASIO library will become part of the C++ standard in the future. However, the ASIO library itself is written in a reasonably modern C++ way. And therefore, any framework we develop on top of it will also be written in a modern C++ way, particularly by the standards of this channel. But I don't want that to put you off if you're just at the beginning of your C++ learning journeys. As this is a multi-part series, I will be stepping through pretty much every line of code and explaining what's going on. So I think there's a lot of educational value to be derived from the building blocks as we create this framework. And so in part one, we'll be looking at how do we acquire and install ASIO. We'll be looking at some basic examples of using it in a non-asynchronous manner. And this will reveal why networking might have a bit of a tough reputation. It'll also reveal some of the problems that we need to solve as part of our framework. Then I'll describe the overall architecture of the framework I'm trying to develop. And then we'll start the development itself on some of the critical building blocks that we need. So let's get started on what I hope is going to be an interesting journey. To begin with, we're going to need ASIO itself, and you can download the ASIO files from think-async.com slash ASIO. ASIO started life as part of the Boost framework, and if you don't know, Boost is a bit of a playground for C++ features, and many of those features eventually make their way into the standard. I can already hear the collective groans of people going, oh no, not Boost. Well, fortunately, ASIO has a non-Boost version, so we don't need the entirety of Boost in order to use it. It can be used standalone. So to get it, we'll head over to the website and we'll, well, download it. Now the version at this time is ASIO 1.18. And in amongst all of these adverts, we can see Boost ASIO 1180.zip. That's the version I'm interested in. The zip file contains the folder, and the folder contains, well, just nothing really other than header files. If we dip into the ASIO folder here, we can see everything is an HPP file. In fact, very rarely, if possibly anywhere in this directory, are there any CPP files at all. ASIO is an entirely header-based framework. And we're a fan of those on the One Lone Coder channel. To install ASIO, simply extract this folder into wherever you install your SDKs. And that's it. Because it's header-based, there are no libraries to link to or anything to build. Next, I'm going to start up Visual Studio and create an empty project. I'm going to create a new solution. We'll see throughout this series that I'll be adding several projects to this solution. But for now, I'm going to create a simple example project and click Create. As you might expect, the empty project contains nothing. So we're going to add a source file to it. Add new item and I will call it simple example. .cpp. And I'm going to add the absolute minimum required for a bare bones project. What I would like to show first is a very simple ASIO program where we'll connect to something on the internet and get some data. It will introduce how we get ASIO up and running, but it'll also demonstrate some of the problems that we're going to face as part of developing our framework. Since we know we're going to use ASIO in this project, we need to link to the project where we've installed the ASIO header files. And in Visual Studio, this is done by going to Project Properties. And I like to make sure that we've got all configurations and all platforms selected. Then when we go to the VC++ directories, we can look at where the include directories are and simply type in the path. On my computer, it's E drive, SDKs, ASIO, 
slash include. Make sure this matches the path to where you installed it. On Linux, you can either install ASIO exactly the same way, or you can install it via the source repositories provided by your vendor. The core of ASIO is simply to include ASIO.HPP. Now ASIO is a vast library with lots of modules and components to it, and it doesn't only just handle networking, it can handle all sorts of interesting forms of input and output to your programs. But for this series I am specifically interested in it doing networking over the internet. And so I'm going to include two additional header files as part of the ASIO library, Buffer, which will handle the movement of memory for us, and Internet which prepares ASIO for all of the things we need to do network communication. Now I mentioned before that ASIO came out of the Boost development framework, but we're not interested in using Boost, so we can tell this ASIO header file that it should be used as standalone. Now on Windows, when we build it, we'll see that we typically get this little warning. Please define Win32 WinNT. This is very much a Windows only problem, and it appears because each version of Windows has slightly different ways of handling networking. Your program will run just fine, it will default to something, but we can tell it uh, specifically which version to use. So we'll try that compile again. Good. Networking on the whole is a huge subject with lots of complexity to it. In this series I'm not interested in the very low level nature of it. I'm not going to be talking about how the TCP protocol works, I'm not going to be talking about subnet masks and routing and all of that stuff. That's for some other time. What I am interested in doing is shifting data from one computer to another. And hopefully I'll demonstrate that you don't need to have a working knowledge of how networks work in order to achieve functional networking code. And as such, it's likely that I'm going to be introducing some code which is going to be quite alien. But once this simple example is finished, you'll see actually it's not so bad. One of the nice things about ASIO is it's very good at handling errors. And so I'll create a variable, ASIO error code EC, which will be used to get, well, specific errors. Fundamentally, ASIO needs a space to perform stuff. And it does this via an object called an ASIO IO context. In a way, you can consider this as a unique instance of ASIO. And it's this context that hides all of the platform specific requirements. Next, we need to construct an address of something that we want to connect to. As the name implies, ASIO can connect many different types of input to output. It doesn't have to be networking. But all of these things that can be connected are referred to as endpoints. So here I've created specifically a TCP style endpoint, which means the endpoint is defined by an IP address and a port. I'm using the make address function to turn this string version of an IP address into something that ASIO can understand. And I'll also pass in our error code variable just in case something goes wrong. If this IP address was malformed, the error code value would have something in it to tell us it has become malformed. ASIO fully supports exceptions as a means of catching errors as well, and we will use some of those later, but for now we're just looking at a nice little variable instead. For our purposes, an endpoint is simply an address. The next thing to add is called a socket. In this case, I specifically want a networking socket. It is the hook into the operating system's network drivers and will act as the doorway to the network that we're connected to. When I create the socket, I associate it with the ASIO context we created earlier. Now I'm going to instruct the socket to attempt to connect to the address that we specified. And here we can check the error code to see if it was successful. The error code variable is quite nice because you can interrogate what its error means at runtime to display it if necessary. So if I run this program, it's going to attempt to connect to this IP address, which is the IP address of a website called example.com. Very basic websites like this communicate on port 80, HTTP. You've probably seen that before. Now I'm just going to add this at the end of my code. I know nobody likes this function, but it's very easy to make videos with it. And I'm going to run the program. And as we can see, connected. Press any key to continue. So ASIO successfully connected to that location. Let's send it to a location where I know there isn't a working port 80 to actually connect to. It's my own machine. And we'll run it again. We can wait. It took some time but it returned no connection could be made because the target machine actively refused it. ASIO is very nice in this regard. Its error messages are descriptive and useful. We just observe something interesting. 
it took time to try and connect to my machine, and we'll see more of this later. If the connection was successful, then if I call the isOpen function on the socket, that should return true, which means I have an active and alive connection to, well, something at the other end, the other endpoint. Since I know I'm trying to connect to a website, the server at the other end is expecting an HTTP request. So I'm going to hack together a completely bare bones HTTP request. It looks like this. And if you weren't aware, yes, the internet works by sending literal text strings around the place. It's quite miraculous that we're still doing it that way. The details of this string aren't actually that important for this series, as we won't be doing things this way. But for now, it serves as a great example of how we're going to send some data to the server and see what it responds with. Once I've constructed this request, I'm going to send it. And I'm going to do that by calling the write sum function of the socket. Write sum means please try and send as much of this data as possible. When reading and writing data in ASIO, you work with ASIO buffers. And an ASIO buffer is really just a container that contains an array of bytes. In this case, I'm taking the bytes from my string and the size of my string to tell it how to dimension that array. For each major transaction, we can also interrogate the error codes, although I'm not going to do that for every function, or else the code will become quite large. Once we've written some data to the server, I'm going to hope that it sends me something back. And I can see if there are any bytes available for me to read by calling the available function on the socket. If there are some bytes, then I'm going to read them from the socket and I will read those into a new vector that I've created, which is sized to the amount of bytes that are available, and I'll call the equivalent read sum function, where again, we're using an ASIO buffer to wrap the standard vector. I will then display to the console the contents of this buffer. So let's run it and see what happens. Oh, well, it connected, but it said there are zero bytes available. Let's see why. I'm going to use the debugger to step through the code line by line. So I'll press Ctrl and F10 to run to this location. I'll construct the string. I'm now going to write some data. And now I'm going to check, are there any bytes of, oh, oh well, hang on, it's a bit different this time. It's saying there's, well, 1,631 bytes available. It seems this time it's worked quite nicely. If I let the program run to completion, we can see that the server has actually returned quite a bit of information. It's returned a bit of a header here to tell me it's accepted my HTTP request, and then it's returned the source code of the website that we connected to. So that all looks fine. What's the problem here? Well, the problem stems from as soon as we wrote the request to the server, we immediately tried to read the response. But the server could be miles and miles away. It takes time for that request to go out, get processed, and return. So when I ran my program at full speed, when I wasn't debugging it, there wasn't enough time for the server to do any kind of response. I'm going to brute force in a delay to see if that helps things. After we have written the data, I'm going to deliberately stall this main thread for 200 milliseconds. This is horrific. If you're ever putting hard-coded delays in your program to make it work, you need to think again. But let's see if it does work. Well, it did. 200 milliseconds looked like adequate time for the request to go out, get processed, and the server to respond with data. This is really bad and really inconvenient for us. I don't want my program waiting 200 milliseconds every time I do any kind of network transaction. Fortunately, ASIO does have some tricks up its sleeve to help. So one of the things I can do is tell it to wait, which will block my running program until there is some data available to read. So let's take a look at that. Well, good, that's worked this time. I'm going to change the IP address to a website that's going to deliver more data and run it again. Well, this time we can see we got, well, a lot more information coming through. But worryingly, it looks like we didn't get all of the information this time. Let's just try running that again. This time, it stopped at a different point, right in the middle of some code. Because of the time delays of the transport and the servers, Varying amounts of bytes might be available for us to read at any one time. And since all we're doing is saying, well, are there any bytes to read, then just try and read them, we're not getting everything. We're starting to see two really significant problems with networking. Firstly, we don't know when things are going to happen. As soon as it leaves our computer, it's beyond our control. Things take time. Secondly, 
and partly related to part one, we don't know how much the server is going to respond with. We don't know how much data to prepare in advance. What size should we make our buffers? I simply don't know. And also putting things like weights and blocking statements in our code is a really bad thing to do. It seems very wasteful. Well, this is where we can start to exploit the asynchronous side of ASIO. What I would like to do is prime ASIO with an instruction that says, well, if some data arrives, read it and display it to the console. Since I don't know how large that data might be at any one time, I'm going to create a reasonably large buffer and just reuse it. I'm creating this outside of the scope of my main program because I'm also going to add in a function which will link to ASIO to handle the data reading for us. And I'm going to call that function grab some data and we pass in the socket. Previously, when we were using ASIO in synchronous mode, we called the read sum function. Now I want to use it asynchronously. So I'm going to call the equivalent async read sum function. This takes in the buffer just as before, but we also need to give it a lambda function. When we call the grab some data function, that in turn calls the async read sum function. And because it's asynchronous, this isn't going to do anything right away. Instead, what it will do is prime the context with some work to do when data is available on that socket to read. And the work we're going to give it is simply reading the data from the socket and putting it in our buffer and displaying it on the screen. So I'll add in the Lambda function here. The prototype of the Lambda function will tell us the error code and the amount of data that was read by the read sum function. If there was no error code, then I'm going to display how many bytes were actually read that time, and then just loop through my buffer, displaying those bytes to the console. I'm then going to call the grab some data function again. And you might think that this is some recursive nightmare, but it isn't. Recall that the async read sum function will prime the ASIO context with some work to do, and then immediately return, i.e. ASIO is going to run in the background when some data arrives on that socket, it's going to implement the code we've put in this Lambda function. If in this first instance, it only reads 100 bytes, but the server has sent 10,000, the grab some data function will call the async read function again, and it will grab a bit more, which will then go and grab a bit more and a bit more until there is no data left to read. And at that point, the async read function will simply wait until there is some data to read. So after we've written our request to the server, I'm no longer interested in reading it manually. Instead, I'm going to call our grab some data function. Let's take a look. Well, we've not been very successful here either. It's connected, but then immediately exited. The reason for this is similar to the first time that that happened. We called the grab some data function straight after issuing the request. This grab some data function would have then primed the IO context to read something asynchronously. But the problem is, our program finished before anything could happen. And this is where starting to think asynchronously can be a little tricky. Instead, I'm going to prime the ASIO context with the ability to read bytes before I send some data. And to stop my program exiting prematurely, I'm also going to put in just a big delay. Let's consider for a moment what we're expecting of the context. We're now lodging with it instructions with which the context has to wait for certain conditions, and then it will execute code associated with those instructions. That waiting part is quite interesting. How does it do that? We've seen already today that when we want to wait for something, it invariably blocks. And we don't want the IO context blocking all the time. One of the things we can do with ASIO is run the context in its own thread. This gives the context some temporal space within which it can execute these instructions without blocking our main program. Here I create a thread of a Lambda function and all that Lambda function does is call the run function of the context. This run function will return as soon as the context has run out of things to do, i.e. there's no instructions registered with it for it to do in the future. Therefore, it is likely by the time that our program has gotten to the line where it starts registering instructions with the context, that the context has finished executing. Fortunately, ASIO gives us a way to deal with this too. We can create some fake work for the context to do. 
So I know you're all thinking, whoa, there's loads of stuff been thrown into this already, but let's just take a step back and recap on what's actually happening. We're creating a context, which is the space where ASIO can do its work, but we need to prime that context with jobs for ASIO to do. If ASIO doesn't have anything to do, it's just going to exit immediately. In the meantime, we can give it some fake jobs to do, which stop it from exiting immediately. We allow that context to run in its own thread. So if it does need to stop and wait, it doesn't block the main program execution. We then connect to our TCP server as before. And when we're successful, we prime the ASIO context with an instruction to read some data if it's available. Once it's primed, we then write our HTTP request and we wait, nothing else to do. This 20 second wait is deliberately long just to stop the program from exiting before we've got all of the data that we needed. The instruction we primed the context with was this read sum function. So it'll read as much as it can and display it to the console. Let's take a look. Well, we can see straight away lots of data appearing. In fact, the entire data of the website appeared reasonably quickly. If I make this buffer much smaller, let's say it's a one kilobyte buffer, and if I look at the data, we can see that each time it was reading 1024 bytes. We had control over how much data could be read for a given read command. But in a cool way, when it got to the end, it only needed to read 548 bytes. It also didn't block or hold up our main program in any way. By thinking in this asynchronous manner, we've managed to overcome some of these problems regarding time delays and buffer sizes. As you can see in this very simple example, thinking asynchronously does provide some benefits, but it's not without its own costs of complexity. When you do start working with asynchronous programs, you have to start thinking a little outside the box. Things aren't going to happen in the order you expect them to. This is what makes it distinct from synchronous programming. But the idea of taking a thing and priming it to do work for us in the future, particularly work involving things with variables such as time delays and buffer sizes is very powerful indeed. Now, for the framework I want to develop, I think needing to think like this is perhaps a little bit too demanding of the end user. That's not to patronize anybody, but I think for a client server system, they don't need to be thinking of it in terms of asynchronous read and write calls. Instead, I want to provide tools and utilities that are flexible enough to have easy message passing between a client and a server, or a server and many clients. And it's the foundations of this framework that we'll be looking at in the rest of this video. So if all of this very ASIO specific stuff has completely passed you by, don't worry too much about it. There's still a lot more interesting things to come. This series is as much about developing a framework as it is the specifics of ASIO. And in the example I've just shown, We've seen how ASIO can handle the temporal properties of communication very well by helping us execute code when and where it is necessary to do so. But the HTTP example highlights one interesting problem. We don't know in advance how much data is going to be sent. And whilst that is a requirement for a lot of interesting applications such as streaming video, it's actually quite inconvenient to work with. Now, before you all start commenting, yes, I know that the HTTP response header contains the number of bytes that are going to be sent. So we could have tried to parse that header and prime buffers accordingly. But in the framework, I'm going to handle things a little differently. All of our data transactions are going to involve messages. And my messages are going to have two primary components. The first is a header. And this header is going to consist of an identifier for what is this message. And secondly, it's going to consist of the size of the entire message, including the header, in bytes. The second part of the message is going to be the message body, which is the payload of the message, but could be zero or more bytes. After all, an event with no particular interesting data doesn't need a body, so why transmit it? Using a configuration like this means we're never transmitting or trying to read data of an unknown size. The header is always sent first, and this is a fixed size, but it contains the information required to prime our system with the requisite size of any body that we want to transmit after the header. This ID could be anything that can make the header distinct. For example, it could simply be an integer. But C++ provides us with some more modern tools, which we can use to validate whether the header is accurate or not 
at compile time rather than runtime. So instead of an integer, I'm going to specify an enum class. An enum class is like the traditional enum structures where you would specify a bunch of symbols and they'd be associated with a value. In this case, there isn't really a value associated with it. The symbol itself is sufficient for the compiler to use it as an identifier for something. And because the enum class is strongly typed in this way, the compiler can identify when we send invalid IDs. If we just used an integer, we could have a bug in our code where we sent an ID that didn't mean anything. And it's very likely that both end of the systems could identify that and get rid of it, but isn't it nice to have the compiler work some of that stuff out for you and tell you in advance? The only problem with using an enum class like this is it's not very flexible. Since I want this framework to be for anybody and everybody that wants networking in their applications, I've no idea what type of messages people are going to need. So I can't go and provide an enum class filled with millions and millions of different types of message. Instead, I'm going to allow the user to specify their own enum class and we'll use templates to customize the message. This way, our framework can behave in a predictable way, but use the user's own messages. When any data is transmitted, it's done so serially. That means I'm also going to add to our message type the ability to serialize and deserialize conveniently. This should make the message type very easy for the user to use. The hope being that by constraining the user in such a way as to use these defined messages for all of their data transactions from the client to the server, then the client and server interfaces can be defined in such a way as to require no additional modification from the user. I'm going to go back to my solution and to it I'm going to add a new project. And I'm going to choose static library, although really I'm just using it because it's an additional folder. And I will call it net common. Now it'll go away and add a load of junk to it, I'm just going to delete it. To my net common project, I'm going to add a new item. And it's simply going to be net common dot h. I'm going to use this header file to include all of the bits that the rest of the networking framework is going to use. It saves me having to duplicate this code in multiple places. And so, for example, I'm going to put in a bunch of the commonly used standard files, and I'm going to include ASIO as well. Notice it's moaning that it can't find ASIO. That's because I also need to specify the include directory for this project, as I did before. I don't know yet whether I'm going to use all of these, they just happen to be the ones that I like, except for Chrono. And now I'm going to add another header file this time net message, and it's in this file that will include the definition of our message object. And the first thing I'll do is include the common file we've just defined. Now it's my intention for this framework to be entirely header only in itself, and that's because ultimately I hope to release it as a pixel game extension. So this is totally optional if you decide to do something similar, but I'm going to create mine within the namespace olc and within that the namespace net. And the first thing I'll define is the structure that represents the message header. So we can see I'm using the template keyword and passing in a template variable t. t will represent the enum class later on. Whatever t happens to be, I create an instance of it called id and I store the size as an unsigned 32-bit integer. I'm deliberately not choosing size t in this instance. Firstly, I believe that an unsigned int 32 will be of sufficient size for all of the data we want to transfer. But secondly, I can't guarantee that size t is the same on a 32-bit and 64-bit system. Let's say my client is using 32 bits, but my server runs on 64 bits. In principle, the same framework code will be compiled for both platforms. But in order to communicate effectively, it's vitally important that the sizes of the types I use in my communication structures don't change. There are often things like this to think about when working with networking, and we won't really look at any others in this series. But one thing to think about is the difference between x86 architectures and say ARM architectures, where the byte ordering of the data is different. If you know that that's going to be the case, then it is quite important that you put in conversion routines when reading and writing the data. But like I say, I'm not worrying about that for this series. I know that my clients are predominantly going to be Windows and Linux computers, and that my server is a Linux computer, running on x86 compatible architectures. Now the message header is defined, we can define the message itself. 
Now, fundamentally, because I have chosen an enum class to represent the ID, everything that relies upon the message header will also need to be a template. This has a knock-on effect because, in fact, everything that then relies on messages will also need to be a template too. If templates aren't for you, you could just go back to specifying an integer. But I see one of the advantages of working this way is it's actually quite suitable for a framework which is entirely comprised of header files. I guess that's a subjective opinion. As I mentioned in the slides, the message contains a message header, and it also contains a body. Now I'm going to use a standard vector of unsigned 8-bit integers for the body. That way we're always working with bytes. And as we've seen many times on the channel, using a vector is a flexible way of working with arrays of data. I'm going to start adding some utility functions to this. The first is something that returns the size. In this case, it returns the size of the message header, including its template. So if our enum class was specified to be a 32-bit integer or an 8-bit integer, that's fine. And we know that our body is only going to consist of individual bytes. And this is where things are going to start getting a little bit modern for the One Lone Coder channel. Whilst debugging all of this framework, it's going to be useful to actually see the packets. So I'm going to add an override for the bit shift left operator, which in this case is tied to standard OS stream. This allows us to easily use our message type with standard C out, so we can output things to the console. In this case, it's a friend because this is really going to be accessed from anywhere by anything. And when this operator is called, it pushes into the output stream a variety of things. I want my messages to be easy to use. So far, to define a message, we would simply create an instance of our message struct, pass in the enum class as its template argument, and it will go and construct the message accordingly. To work with the body of the message, I could work with the vector directly, but I'm also going to add some convenient operator overloads that will allow us to treat the vector like it were a stack. In principle, let's say I have some variables, float x and y, I would like to simply just take my message object and pipe into it x and then pipe into it y. And to get data back out of the message, I do it the other way around. I don't want this to just be limited to only floats. I want it to work for, well, any trivial data type. So let's work on first pushing data into the body vector. Perhaps confusingly, I'm going to use the same operator as we did with Cout, but this time the types surrounding it are fundamentally different. So we'll be able to know which one is being called at any given time. This is the message object that contains the body that I wish to update, and so I'm going to create this as a template function within the message struct. This way, if the user attempts to push a float in, data type becomes float. If you push an integer, it becomes an integer. If they push a struct of any description, well, it becomes that struct. There are, however, certain data types in C++ that you can't trivially serialize. These might be classes that contain static variables or complex arrangements of pointers. So I'm going to use a little bit of modern C++ here and actually check that the type provided to this override is considered to be a standard layout, i.e. it's not too complicated. I'm then going to cache the current size of the body vector. Now to begin with, this will be zero, and as we start adding more things to it, the vector will increase by the size of the objects that we're pushing into it. I'll need to make room for those objects by resizing the body vector, and I'll do that by looking at its current size added to the size of the, well, generic data type that we're pushing in. The vector is now large enough to take in those additional bytes. So looking at the vector's previous size, we know where to start copying the memory of the new data type into the end of the body vector, into that space that we've just created. Since the body vector has now changed in size, I'm going to update the size variable in the message header. That way the header always accurately reflects the size of the message. Now the way I'm overloading this operator is to return a reference to the message itself. This allows us to chain together arbitrary objects of arbitrary type pushing them all into the vector. There are advantages and disadvantages to doing it this way. One of the advantages is it should handle most data types, and it will automatically resize and allocate the memory of the message for us. One of the disadvantages could be performance. Each time we add something to the message's body vector, it needs to be resized. However, vector is smart enough to know that as it's growing, it shouldn't grow linearly, and in practice, we'll see that there's actually minimal overhead in doing it this way. 
Now, looking at how we're structuring this, you might think, well, surely it's more convenient to do this in the same order when dealing with getting data out of the body vector. Well, let's look at the implementation of this override and see why that's not going to be the case. As before, I'm going to check that the data being extracted from the body vector is trivial. Now, this time, we're taking the data from the end of the vector. So I want to cache a location, which is from the vector's end, minus the size of the data we're trying to extract. Then I'll physically copy that data from the vector into the user's variable. We've now took data out of it, so we should reduce the size of the vector. And this is where we don't see a performance hit, because making a vector smaller than its original size doesn't cause any reallocation. If we were to take the data from the front of the vector, then that data needs to be removed from the front of the vector, and that will cause quite a significant reallocation each time we extract data. So by treating the body vector like a stack, we can ignore unnecessary vector reallocations. Finally, just as before, I want to make sure that the header size reflects the accurate size of the message and return the message itself. And for the professionals out there, there is a way you can do this with iterators, which will allow you to extract the data from the vector in the same order that you put it there. However, you need to think about where you store that iterator in between extractions. Here I've added another project to my solution called NetClient, and I've configured it with ASIO just as before. And I've added a source file called simpleclient.cpp. One of the convenient things to do in Visual Studio is to right-click on the project and go to Build Dependencies and select Project Dependencies. So I always want my Net Client project to depend on my Net Common project. That way, any changes to Net Common will also cause Net Client to recompile. For convenience to my Net Common project, I'm also going to add one more header file, and I'm going to call it olcnet.h. And all this is going to do is include the other headers in this project. Then, if I go to my Net Client project, go to its properties, in my include directories path, I'm also going to add the path to net common. To this simple client and example program, I can now simply include olcnet.h. Let's put the theory into practice. I'm going to create an enum class to contain my message types. And for now, I'll use the name custom message types. I'm also going to specify that this enum class be implemented using uint32ts. That way, each type ID is going to be four bytes. I'll put in the ones I had before. Fire bullet and move player, for example. This means if I wanted to construct one of my messages, I do so the following way. You can see I've constructed it there with my custom message types type. I go to message.header.id and it will only allow me to specify things from my custom types. This is a nice thing. If I specified something else, the compiler will complain. By adding constraints to what's allowed, we're encouraging the compiler to help us write better code in the first place. Well, let's test our message type. So let's create a variable called a of type integer, and we'll give that the value 1. Let's create a boolean, b, we'll give that the value true. Let's create a floating point, c, and we'll give that the value pi. And let's create something less trivial, perhaps. So here we've got a struct of x and y, and we're going to have five of them in an array, and that's d. And I want to put all of that into the message. Well, it's simply a case of a, b, c, and d. Once I've put those in, I'm going to get rid of the original values. I'm just going to set them to something completely different and then read them back out of our message. We can see the compiler is happy, but let's step through the code and see what's happening. I'm going to run to this line first and see what happens. So I'm going to press F11 in Visual Studio, which allows me to step into a function. And we can see it's stepped into our operator overload. It's going to push the integer a into the vector. I'll now run to here and we'll have a look at what the body vector contains. It says we've got a header with the ID fire bullet and that the size of the whole packet is 57 bytes. Where's it got that 57 from? Because that would be a good indication as to whether it's pushed the right amount of data in. Well, we know that the header is uint32 for the ID and uint32 for the size, so that's eight bytes. We've then got 
another 4 here for this integer, 12, a single one for this boolean, 13, another 4 here for this float, so that's 17, then we've got 8 here times 5, so that's 40, plus the 17 we had before, that's 57 bytes. So that's a good indication that the vector has all of our information in it. But we can see if it's there or not. So let's clear out these values now by setting them to something else. And then reading those back out of our message body. If we look at our value A is 1, which is set to. B is true, which is good. C is pi. And D is a load of undefined junk because we didn't actually define it when we pushed it in. So here we've created a very flexible and quite user-friendly way of constructing a message to which we always know all of the parameters. We know how big it is and we know what the message is for. And where possible, the compiler is going to sanity check it for us. Now we have an established message format. So it's time to start thinking about how those messages are moved around the system. In a server-client framework, there are always going to be two halves. One is the client, one is the server. In a massively multiplayer online game, the client is typically the thing the player uses, the way you're running around the map. The server fulfills a few roles. One, it allows the information exchange between clients. But two, and perhaps more importantly, it can also run the game itself. It's responsible for what's going on in the game world. And when you're developing a game, it's very difficult to shoehorn in network later on. So it's good to start thinking about your game's architecture from day zero with networking in mind. And we'll see a lot more of that in the next couple of episodes. But for now, let's just focus on how we move messages around. The client application is going to run doing its thing. And whilst it's running, it's going to check to see if any messages have been delivered. Between checks, multiple messages could have been delivered. So these messages are going to accumulate in an input message queue. The client could, however, at any time, send a message to the server. In a very similar way, the server is always running too. And it too is periodically going to check a queue for incoming messages. The server too is capable of sending a message at any time. Conceptually, I want us to imagine that the client has a connection to the server and the server has a connection to the client. These two connections are connected together via ASIO and sockets. Connections accumulate a queue of outgoing messages and send them, but connections also receive messages and deposit them in the queues of the client and the server. And as you can probably tell already, the ASIO and socket framework does a little bit of a switcheroo. Clients can only have one connection, but servers can have multiple connections. And so in this instance, I've added another client and its connection path, and the server can choose to output to clients individually, or it can output to them all simultaneously. But an important feature for this framework is there is only one message input queue for the server. This way, our server application can run on a single thread responding to messages as they are sent by the clients, hopefully in the order that they're sent. When we draw out the architecture like this, it's useful to start to see what are the common components. Well, one of the things that we see is we've got queues. And all of these queues, are, well, they're the same thing. They're queues of our messages. So we know we need a queue structure. If you look carefully at these connection objects, other than being reflected in the y-axis, they're identical. So we're going to need to create a connection object too. The clients will share the same interface. So I'm proposing we create a client interface object. And finally, we have the server. The server is unique and different to a client in that it can be connected to multiple clients via multiple connection objects. We can also see that the framework sufficiently abstracts away all of the ASIO specific code. Fundamentally, whatever implements the client or the server needn't concern itself with actually how the networking code works. So let's now add a few more interfaces to our framework. And to add to the net common project, another header file called net thread safe queue, TSQ in this case. Now, the reason it needs to be a thread safe queue is at any given time, it's being accessed by the client or it's being accessed by the connection. And especially in the case of the server, there's plenty of connections possibly trying to write to that queue, 
and the server will read from it whenever it needs to. All of these things are happening at various points in time. Probably we haven't got control of when that happens, as we saw earlier on in this video. Data takes time to move around. And given that fundamentally we're basing all of this on an asynchronous input-output library, as we're taking all of these parallel sporadic requests and trying to serialize them into a queue, we need to make sure that the queue is thread safe. Implementing a thread safe queue is actually not a very difficult task, but I'm choosing to implement it using locks, which means as something is trying to write to the queue, nothing else can read from it. There are lock free thread safe queues out there, but I'm keeping this simple and accessible for the video. In my OLC net namespace, I'm going to create a class queue. And you'll notice it's already a template class. This is because if I'm going to the effort of creating a thread safe queue, I don't need it to just store my messages. I might as well make it applicable to storing well anything at all. Fundamentally, my queue is going to store objects in a standard double ended queue or deck and I will be using a standard mutex to protect access to that double-ended queue. To the queue, I'm going to use a default constructor, and I'm not going to allow the queue to be copied, primarily because it's got mutexes in it. And really implementing a thread-safe queue is just a case of adding guarding to the standard functions provided to the double-ended queue. So if I call the front method of my queue, I expect to get a reference to the object at the front of the queue. There it is, deckQ.front. But I'm using a standard scoped lock and my mutex to protect anything else from running whilst this particular line is being actioned. As well as the front, we'll have the back. It's a double-ended queue, so we have the ability to push something to the back of the queue and push to the front. We can also add some convenience functions such as empty, count, the number of items in the queue, and clear, which erases all of the items in the queue. I'm going to add two more functions, which are a variation of those provided by the double-ended queue. The first is pop front, because I actually want it to return the item, not just remove it. So I apply my scoped lock, and I locally cache the object before calling the double-ended queue's pop front function, because that will just remove it, it doesn't return it. And then I return the item that I've just cached. In a similar way, I can pop back too. Since I have a clear function, I can also add in a destructor, which will call that clear function when the queue is destroyed. And that's all there is to it. All we've done is put a scoped lock guarding mechanism in place for the regular routines we would see on a double-ended queue type. As messages are being pushed around the system, when they come into the server, the server application needs to know where that message came from, in case it needs to respond back to the same client. From the server's perspective, the thing that identifies a client is the connection. So I'm going to add a modified message type which also contains a pointer to the connection that message came in on. We can use the same thing at the client end too, though in this case it's a little redundant because the clients will only ever have one connection which invariably points to the server. To my message header file I'm going to add another object called an owned message. Fundamentally, the owned message simply encapsulates a regular message, but is also tagged with a shared pointer to a connection object. And we've not defined the connection object just yet. Just for the sake of completeness, I'm also going to overload the uh, output stream operator so we can output this using standard cout. This connection object we haven't defined, but we are using it here. So I need to forward declare that this connection exists. and as it is implied here, the connection is also going to be a template class. In fact, everything that we create as part of this framework will fundamentally be a template class relying on that enum class that defines the messages. On the whole, any messages coming into a client or a server will be tagged with the connection that they came in via. That way, if necessary, we can specify that connection as a target of output. I'm going to add three more header files net connection, net server, and net client to represent the three remaining objects in our framework. In this specific video, we won't get around to the full implementations of these, but we can start to lay out the interface. Both the client and the server depend on a connection. So let's define that first. And our connection is going to include from the common, our queue, and our message. Fundamentally, the connection is a template class, but it's going to inherit from a rather strange object standard enabled shared from this 
This will allow us to create a shared pointer internally from within this object. Ultimately, it's similar to the this keyword we've been accustomed to on the channel before, but it provides a shared pointer to this rather than a raw pointer. For now, I'm going to leave the constructor and destructor blank. I'll add some convenient utilities, such as connect to server, disconnect, and is connected. Connect to server will only be called by clients. Disconnect can be called by both clients and servers and will shut down the connection. And is connected returns, well, is the connection valid and open and currently active? Connections allow us to send messages. So we'll have a send message function. And you can see it's the message parameterized with the template variable T. The connection's also responsible for the ASIO stuff. Each connection will have a socket. We know that ASIO can't run and sockets can't function without an IO context. And this is where things can get a little strange. A server can have multiple connections, but I don't want it to have multiple ASIO contexts. I want the ASIO context to behave in tandem. So the connection will be provided with an ASIO context by the client or the server interface. Recall that connections only contain queues of messages going out. So I'm creating a thread safe queue of my regular message type called queue messages out. The connection alongside ASIO will interrogate this queue and send the messages when required. Messages coming into the server or the client are stored in a queue owned by the server or the client, but the connection needs to know where that queue is. So I'm also going to create a thread safe queue of owned messages in this case, but it's just a reference to a queue. That queue is expected to be provided by the server or the client. Effectively, the connection object is the glue. In the client header file, we're going to define a client interface class. The client interface is responsible for setting up ASIO and setting up the connection, but then also acts as an access point for your application to talk to the server. As I've just mentioned in the connection, the server and the client must provide a physical queue to store incoming messages. So we'll add that to the client interface. The client interface owns the ASIO context. And as we saw at the start of the video, the context alone doesn't do very much. It needs a thread. Now you might be thinking, I thought we said we were going to have the connection handle all of the ASIO stuff. Well, that's true, but the client will need to set up the connection and the connection will only exist if it's valid. So to begin with, the client will handle the ASIO stuff, do whatever negotiation is required with the server, and then set up a connection. Therefore, the client will start out with a socket of its own, and if a connection can be established, it will create it as a unique pointer, and then hand over the ASIO stuff to the connection. This is how I've decided to do it. You could change this for your own implementations. Other functions our client interface might need would be something like connect where we can pass in a nice friendly URL and a port number. If we've got a connect, we usually always want a disconnect too, so the client can shut down the connection. It may be convenient for the client application to know that the connection is still valid. And finally, the client application is going to need access to this queue. Now the queue itself is private. It could be made public, but I'm going to use a little accessor function. Finally, our class needs a constructor and a destructor. The constructor is simply going to associate the socket with the ASIO context. For the client, there is only one socket and one context. And when the client is shut down, we'll call disconnect just to make sure everything does shut down cleanly. We can actually fill some of these in now, just intuitively, even though the implementation for most of this framework doesn't exist. For example, is connected, all we need to do is make sure that the connection does exist, and then we'll call the connections is connected function. Connect is a little bit more tricky, and we'll cover that significantly in the next video. It's in this function that we'll call ASIO to physically connect to the server. Now, instead of using the error code, I'm going to catch exceptions in this instance. Because the nice thing about ASIO errors, as we said at the start, is that they're quite verbose. And there'll be several things we want to do in here. Firstly, create the connection object. Then we actually want to create the address of where we're connecting to. Now, at the start of this video, we specified it directly as an IP address. However, ASIO provides an object called a resolver, which can take in a URL or a string form or an IP address and convert that into something it can use to connect across a network. It just produces endpoints like we had at the start. However, the resolver can fail because if you type in a URL that it can't reduce to an IP address, then it will throw an exception. 
if we do remain with a valid address, we'll be able to call the connect to server function of the connection. And then finally, create the thread that the ASIO context can run within. There are a few bits missing up here, which we'll cover in the next video. Disconnecting then is just a way of being courteous. We'll check if the connection is actually connected, and if it is, disconnect. Either way, we want to make sure that the ASIO context isn't running, and we'll stop the thread that it's running within. Since we've disconnected, we're also done with the connection object, so we'll release that unique pointer. Now, I appreciate that this is going to be a little bit frustrating. Usually at the end of a video, I like to give an example of it all working and running. However, because this is part one of a series, that's not going to be the case. There's simply too much code to fit into one video and come up with a working result. And so instead, I'm going to finish off by showing what writing the client application might look like to the end user of our framework. And I think you might agree that it is a real simplification. Once you've established your message types, as we've done here, we can then derive from our client interface to create a custom client for our application. And it's at this point that the templates start to disappear. Here I've created custom client, and here I have derived it from our client interface, but passed along our custom message type enum class. The connect, disconnect, and isConnect functions, they're all handled for us, so we can get stuck straight into actual functional stuff. So let's say I wanted to tell the server that I'm firing a bullet at a particular location. I can simply create a function called fireBullet, which takes in a float x and a y. This function then goes and creates the message, passes in the data, and sends it. And then somewhere in our main game application, we'll create an instance of our custom client, connect to somewhere with a specific port, and whenever we need to tell the server that a bullet is being fired, we just call our function. As it stands, this code won't compile. We've not built most of it, we've not provided implementations for a lot of it either, but I hope at this stage you can see that actually our framework has taken a complex phenomena such as a client-server relationship and reduced it into quite a flexible yet simple and easy to use interface. Now this is always the case with part ones. You're either really frustrated that we've not gotten anywhere or it's completely put you off because it's not finished, or you're really eager for part two to see where it goes. And in part two, we will fully implement the connection, the client and the server, and actually have messages moving around. It's just this video has gone on long enough. But what we have got here already is a nice framework uh, with an established messaging system and queues through which we can start doing these transactions. At the moment, we've only been taking a really high level look at the problems that we're going to have to solve in the next couple of videos. And we'll be tackling things such as timing and making sure that the connections are robust and that all of our messages are appearing in the order that we actually expect them to. How do we handle things such as network failure and client disconnects when we don't expect them? And if progress is going well, we'll look at how we can make login systems too. So I hope you look forward to all of that. In part three, we'll start actually implementing a bit of a game using the Raycast world engine I showed in the last video, uh, so we can have lots of characters running around a maze, killing each other. But for now, if you've enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up please, have a think about subscribing, come and have a chat on the Discord. I will put the source code up for this on the GitHub, but as you know, it's incomplete, it won't function, uh, but you can have a look at it for sure. Until then, see you next time and take care.